Uh, knowledge is, as you know, an increasingly important component of production and distribution in, in the whole economy. And we have an increasing number of knowledge workers. Um, uh, and uh, there are various measures of that. Uh, in the amount of investment that goes into intellectual capital as opposed to physical capital. There are lots of measures, the amount of trade uh, and so forth. And <clears throat> of course, the most valuable part of knowledge, uh, economically speaking, and pro probably socially too, is new knowledge. And intellectual property covers new knowledge. Uh, and so as knowledge has become an increasingly important component in the economic system, uh, so too is intellectual property. And that's why we all now uh, confront a situation which is very different from the one that uh, we had 20 years ago, when nobody had heard of intellectual property, really, uh, at all, where we see it uh, on an almost daily basis in our newspapers. So that's the context, and uh, let's have a discussion. I want to know, is there really any intellectual property for coding or any such computer programs that actually fuel all this technology that is going to soon take us over? Mm. Uh, yes, there is. So the first uh, intellectual property application would be that coding is treated as text and therefore as copyrightable. So it's like a book right. or, or another publication. Uh, that's the sort of conventional approach that all uh, computer programs coding are uh, text and therefore subject to copyright. Um, but copyright has its limitations. Uh, and increasingly, over the last 20 years, people have developed uh, uh, patent protection or applied patent protection for what they call computer implemented inventions. So you can't theoretically get a patent on a mathematical model or a mathematical equation or anything which doesn't have an application, which is a theoretical. Uh, but you can have an, implementation, an, an invention that is implemented by a computer program, and that's how they get protection for the computer program. It's a, not, it's a subject that's not without controversy uh, because the most liberal, if I can say, jurisdiction uh, appro uh, approaching this is the United States, where broadly speaking, and again I'm generalising, everything under the sun, to use the words of the Supreme Court, made by humans is patentable. Um, <clears throat> that's the broadest approach. Now, uh, in uh, Europe, again, it's a very generalized, big generalization, they tend to say um, it must have a technical function to be patentable. Uh, and so it's a little bit more restrictive. Uh, but yes, there is uh, intellectual property protection for um, computer programs or coding of those two varieties in particular. It's not without controversy because a lot of people in the computer world say, well, open source uh, or right. um, copy left or whatever it might be, uh, but it is there. Do you think that the world um, should uh, coordinate intellectual property at an international level that, rather than just national? And could you tell us how and why? Yes. Uh, well, look, <clears throat> um, I think intellectual property uh, ideas, let's say, to put it at its broadest, and knowledge are highly mobile. Uh, so there's very little that happens in one country that isn't capable of application in another country. And indeed, <clears throat> uh, this organisation, World Intellectual Property Organisation, has two foundation um, uh, uh, treaties, and they both were concluded in the 1880s uh, when there was a wave of globalisation. Because if you go back to that period, it was the period of the steamship, the railways, uh, the telegraph, so increased communication and transportation and movement and increased trade as a consequence of the uh, of uh, steamships and, and railways. Uh, <clears throat> and in that time, uh, they used to have, as they still have, we'd call them now expos, but they used to have international exhibitions. 
uh, and there was an international exhibition being organized in Paris, the international exhibition in Paris. And inventors said, <clears throat> but if we put our new inventions there, anyone can just come along and copy them. So we need some protection. And that was the foundation of the Paris Convention, which is one of the foundation treaties of this organization, that if you displayed an invention at an international convention, you had protection for a certain period. Uh, and the other <coughs> foundation uh, convention was the, in the Berne Convention, and that came out of Victor Hugo, Victor Hugo uh, and other authors who, because of the globalization that was occurring at that stage, their works were being uh, pirated, let's say, uh, in different countries. And their copyright law in France applied only to France. So it couldn't stop someone reproducing the book in England or Germany or wherever else it might be. So they said, we need an international approach to this. Uh, and the international approach of the Berne Convention is, if you publish a book in any Berne Convention country, it's automatically protected in all other Berne Convention countries. Uh, so I think from a very early stage, there has been a recognition on the part of the international community that intellectual property needs an, an international approach. Uh, and interestingly, if you look in terms of the international organisations, what were the first ones? The very first one was uh, the Postal Union, the Universal Postal Union, because, you know, you obviously, if you post a letter in Geneva for Turkey, uh, it has to be recognised, uh, the stamp has to be recognised. So that was a very fundamental thing. And then the second one was the telecommunications because of the telegraph. And then the third one was WIPO, or its predecessor. So it was very, very early recognition. Now, I think what, what the stage we're at now is um, what needs to be internationalised. You know, there's no doubt there has to be in some international, but what needs to be internationalised and what needs to stay local? And that's a controversial question, you know. What was your understanding of intellectual property when you were a teenager? And how has your sense on intellectual property changed through the years? I'd say my understanding of intellectual property as a teenager was zero, you know, it was like zero, zero. Uh, and um, that's partly because I was born in the Stone, Stone Age, you know, and I think it's different if you're born now or in recent, let's say, in the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, it's different because you're growing up in the knowledge economy, you know, and it's, it's everywhere. Uh, so I r r confess zero, you know, knowledge. And then over time, I think I've been very fortunate to live through this period in which it's become, um, to happen to have stumbled into intellectual property at a time when it's become uh, increasingly central and increasingly important. Uh, and I think what's happened uh, during that time, it seems to me, is two things uh, in particular. Complexity, it's become more complex. You know, it's no longer Edison making a light bulb. The accumulation of technology is, it introduces enormous complexity, I think. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one thing. And then I think the other thing is probably balance. You know, uh, where do you strike the right balance? Because around innovation, there are a whole uh, series of interests which are not necessarily compatible. You know, they're conflicting. There's the, so the inventor's interest is obviously very different from the consumer's interest. Uh, so the company's producing or the university's producing in new inventions, they want to see them protected so they can exploit them commercially and get some return. But then consumers have a very different approach, you know, and that's the same with, uh, you know, the difference between the interests of a musician, a performer, or a composer of music, and a consumer. So the consumer's immediate interest might be, you know, I'd like the, the music free. But the performer uh, has to find a way to have a sustainable, you know, economic existence. Uh, so uh, it, there are, I think, inevitably tensions in intellectual property, uh, which are never going to be fully resolved. The only thing you can do is find a balance at some stage, between the various interests, say, okay, it's so much for them, so much for them. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
Um, so, looking forward, are there any changes um, that you think intellectual property and the intellectual property system are going to have to go to to go through the changes they're going to have to go through to accommodate the evolving world going forward? Yeah. Well, look, uh, my hope is always that uh, things are not cast as black or white. It's the biggest challenge is is uh, trying to get us away from an ideological approach to these questions to a more pragmatic approach uh, in which we can, you know, assess good, come up with good solutions that are going to take into account the complexity of interests that are involved. Uh, and I think that's a big challenge. Uh, look, I think there are a multitude of other challenges um, and you can probably group, th group them in various ways, um, and I would say two things in particular there. Um, the access question is always going to be a you know, major question, whether it's music or pharmaceutical, um, you know, new drugs. Access is, is always uh, going to be a challenge for us. Um, <clears throat> that, and then I think the, the whole question of what m can you have a property right on? is going to be a challenge. So can you have a property right on, uh, you know, traditionally we make in the intellectual property system a distinction between a discovery on the one hand and an invention on the other hand. So a discovery is when a scientist uncovers what actually exists already in nature. So they actually describe something that already exists. An invention is some human intervention on what already exists to make something new. Uh, but that becomes, that's fairly clear when we say it like that, but when you start to apply it to uh, the isolation of gene sequences uh, or other particular elements, it becomes much more difficult to say you know, it, should you have a property right on that or not? So that's another big challenge. You know, what can be the subject of a property right? Yeah. If you had to name the three biggest inventions uh, that changed the world in the last 30 years, well, what would they be? And, uh, if possible, were they protected by intellectual mm. property law? Well, I suppose you'd have to count the internet uh, as one. But then it's, it's a little bit difficult to say what was the invention there. You know, was it the Internet Protocol, which was Vint Cerf uh, and Bob Kahn? Or was it the World Wide Web, a bit later, which really made it accessible to everyone? Or was it, um, you know, uh, some of the platforms and other things that have been built on it? So it's rather difficult to say what it was. But there's no doubt that the internet has completely transformed our existence, you know, completely transformed our existence. And there, there is not really an intellectual property protection. And if you were to propose it, you would be shouted down, I think, you know. Uh, so um, decisions were taken by those, you know, involved not to claim property rights on it. Um, and, uh, and, and let's remember, Property, you know, you can do what you like with your property. If you want to give it away, you can. Um, and some people find it convenient to give it away. You know. uh, so that's one. Then I, I think, you know, the, and it's a big field, but molecular biology must be, you know, the whole. And, and then we're talking about a huge range. And this must be huge uh, in, in terms of its the impact that, that that is having on our lives and will have on our lives uh, in the future. And you did ask for three, but I've only got two. Uh, so <laughs> I'll stop at that point here. Yeah.